How are you today? Good. How are you doing? Doing fantastic. Living the dream. <laughs> that is the go-to phrase right now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Looks like we've got everybody coming in. We're going to go ahead and get started. Hi, my name is Katie Jeter. I'm the coordinator for Rick's Works and Family Programs at the University of Houston. On the call we've got with us. My name is Abby Van Note. I serve as the coordinator of instructional and inclusive programs at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. My name is John Janis. I'm the assistant director for Rec Sports and Family Programs here at the University of Houston as well. All right. I do want to thank you guys for uh, jumping on this call today, jumping on this round table, uh, just so we can all come into a community to talk about what is a very fluid situation with, with COVID-19. Um, with summer quickly approaching, I think all of us have questions and hopefully resources and things that we want to share with the group. Uh, before we get into it, you've probably been to a bunch of these already, but we're just going to circle back and hit over uh, just the purpose of it. So just so you guys know, if you have other coworkers or people who maybe wanted this or later you find that it's very beneficial and you want to share it, we are going to be recording the session. It is recorded. Uh, we do ask that you please ensure that your mic is muted. Um, we're going to be using the chat box function for questions and comments, and Abby will be um, monitoring that pretty actively. So if you have anything that we notice is like really beneficial, we'll have you unmute, come into the call, share that. Um, and then we're going to continue, I would say, continue using um, the discussion boards as well as if you've heard of um, American Campus or, or what did I? Ooh, I'm going to move this. American Camp Associations, ATA discussion boards, please use that as well, because uh, those are great platforms just to see the conversations that are happening surrounding camp and what how we're kind of moving with this COVID-19 um, pandemic that has gotten to us. Uh, in addition, guidelines just for participation. Please be respectful of all attendees and their concerns. Uh, you guys, like I said, it's a fluid situation. It's a very uh, odd situation I don't think any of us have run into before. Uh, so we're at very different levels of how we're addressing the situation, if we're addressing the situation at all yet. Um, so the round table is a no judgment zone. It's a free space. Uh, so feel free to talk through that. We do want to talk about things that are um, potentially affecting our program and not so much us personally. Uh, if we have time at the end, we will definitely give you that time for that self-care to kind of talk with the group and give you that hug, that virtual hug. Uh, but at the top part, we'll stay pretty productive. Uh, any discussion uh, should be focused around the role, our roles as higher professionals. All right, so just so you guys know how we're moving throughout this discussion, the first thing that we're going to kind of talk through is uh, camp structure, and uh, John will kind of lead a poll at the top of that to tell you uh, what that looks like. Uh, then we'll go into registration processes and policy adaptations, um, and then circling or ending out, we'll talk through staff recruitment, hiring, and training processes, and we will leave some time like I said, if you have any questions that come up in the chat, we're fluid to talk through those. Uh, so Abby will bring those in and uh, we'll voice that out. Cool. So we'll jump right in. With the poll. There we go. <laughs> yeah, so a poll should be popping up for all you guys, really talking about what's your current planning right now. Uh, obviously, it changes day to day, but I think it's really important to share with for us as we kind of facilitate like what's what are we all doing right now um so it's kind of basically what's your current plan for programming um hey you're going full steam ahead we're going to plan as if we're going to be in person or you already have made decisions that you're reducing and modifying maybe examples like uh here at uh we're, we're planning for eight weeks um we talked about it are we going to reduce to four weeks or you're offering virtual um offerings right now or you've gone ahead and canceled all uh, summer 2020 camp programs as a whole, so. All right, so as you guys are uh, answering that, something that we've kind of noticed popping up on the boards have been a lot of campuses are now creating their uh, go or no go. Um, breakdowns of hey if we are going to function as a camp or to answer the question are we functioning as a camp this summer at all um so if any of you have already started that and want to kind of offer up like hey what are questions that you're asking to decide whether or not we will be go or no go feel free to throw those in the chat um just so we can see if you're still in that deciding phase or if it has been decided for you <laughs> there's 
to the chat. Are you guys seeing those results? I do not see the results popping up. Um, Abby, can you see them? Nope, can't see them. All right, well, it tells me I'm sharing, so I don't know why it's lying, but I'll tell you what it says. Uh, so 70% of folks, uh, 84 people participated. So 59 of those 84 are planning camp with original offerings, proceeding as normal. 29% uh, planning camp with reduced or modified offerings, 15% are exploring virtual camp options, and 7% six folks have canceled summer 2020 camp. All right. All right. So there's still a little hope out there. Hey, yo. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so with that, let's circle back and we kind of talked about just seeing how it looks like most of us are still in that boat of, hey, we're going to continue steam full, full steam ahead to offer camp, um, are you modifying at all? Was that result for modification or full normals, Erin? Sorry, say again? Oh, <laughs> was it mainly the, what's the um, major percentage for modifications or for normal? Normal was the biggest. All right, so with that being said, let's go ahead and we'll jump right over if we're gonna be um, operating normal looks like the majority of us are still moving ahead have you already made any um adaptations to your policies or your processes so um jumping into like timeline of registration um we already said we're proceeding as normal or postponed until further notice but with your registrations have you um decided to do any kind of contingencies with looking at how schools are currently starting to cancel um, uh, or even push back their timelines, which could impact your camp. Um, are there any like add-ons that you have? I know here at University of Houston, our swim lessons are a part of yet separate from camp. Uh, so we put a hold on um, swim lessons just because aquatics have their same EAPs that they have to deal with. Um, do we have anything coming from the chat we wanna pull in? I think people are still kind of rolling in on the chat. Um, but focusing on registration, there's some conversation about not taking deposits currently, especially for those who haven't opened camp registration yet. Um, it looks as though a lot of people have not launched their registrations and are going to hold off a little bit. We're still on. A lot of folks seem to be waiting from upper leadership on their campuses about if they can operate and getting that yes and a go ahead. Okay. Oh, it looks it like at WVU, Kareen, you guys are doing a zero payment, zero down payment so they can register, but they can't uh, fully come in yet. Okay. A lot of folks earlier were talking about if they're not operating as normal, but pushing to July, August programming instead of maybe May, June offerings. Okay. Um, okay. Have, oh. I think it's a great opportunity for uh, Kareen from uh, West Virginia. If you wanna speak on, on behalf of that like zero down process and what that looks like, it looks like a couple other people are looking at, at that, but that's a great thing to talk about, I feel like. I would love to. Hi, everybody. My name is Kareen Pruitt. I'm the Operations and Events Coordinator at WVU, also oversee our youth programming. Um, so we, our structure is a, you can do a full payment option, um, but then you can also have a $50 down payment option. You just have to pay in full um, seven days prior to um, camp starting. Uh, so we went ahead and waived um, that as an option. So um, now they can just um, go and go through the process of registering. And then when they check out, they select the zero payment option. Um, that way, we're, we figured we would be able to show a truer um, truer numbers to what we would actually be doing. We had to submit loss of revenue numbers earlier today um, with what we would anticipate losing, either A, now having to refund everybody that has signed up or um, those that we know are interested. So it's, it also helps give the parents peace of mind that if we were to run, they do have an option um, of childcare for that week. Um, 
but that's kind of the decision that we came to and it's been we have had registrations rolling since implementing that so um, I think it's it's been working for us at least okay very cool and it looks like I have a Christopher Ballot you guys are talking about how even with your registration you split camp by age group and have half the kids in one area and another area can you kind of talk a little bit more about I guess the structure of how you're actually structuring your operations with camps sorry I'm outside so it might be a little loud but Essentially, we have two facilities, a rec center and a field house, and we're looking to put the older kids in one facility and then the younger kids in the other. And then we kind of just do the first half of the day in each facility and then we switch. That way we have roughly 20 kids in each building instead of 40 or 50, um, just to make sure there are less people in one place at a time. Okay, very cool. Are you guys adapting any of the activities that they're doing? Um, it's pretty pre preliminary right now, but we are going to look to do some different things based on the age because already we have some issues with the 12 year olds and the five year olds doing the same thing. So uh, we're hoping to kind of be able to, yeah, essentially make different things for each age group and make sure that they are able to be in the same facility for some things, but realistically try to have them separate most of the time. All right, sweet deal, thank you. All right. There's been some communication in the chat about smaller camps and capping numbers. Um, I've seen both uh, at a one to eight ratio and then just to be able to um, have that social distancing in spaces. So, um, Crystal, do you wanna talk a little bit about the thought process between the one to eight and some of your questions or concerns? I'll ask a question of the group. Um, Crystal Durham has, has a suggestion about limiting camp groups to a max of eight campers with one counselor. Um, they are worried about the safety with only one counselor. Has anyone thought about that or have any, um, is anyone in a similar situation? Oh. Someone, uh, Dominique, um, brought up the um, the ratio for bathroom and water and things, incidents of having that buddy whenever you're uh, dealing with kids. Yeah, and I just wanted to add to that in general, you want to have like a one to three ratio, one to two ratio with students. So like with every adult, there's always at least one other camper. Mm -hmm. So in theory, it makes sense, but in application, it does not. For sure, and the chat is looking like a lot of people uh, try to avoid single staff at all times. So um, making sure that you're not only staying within ACA accreditation requirements, but also best practices with youth um, and one-to-one -one interactions and trying to limit those. Okay. And it looks like we have some things coming in just about like daycare licensure, ACA accreditations, make sure you're following under the guidelines of any um, higher organizations that you fall under. Um, there has been a little bit of conversation about registration and refunds. So I would open it up in the chat for anyone who has um, added a COVID-19 related clause about refunds or finances. What does that look like? What language are you using? How are you going to make decisions about refunds? Um, especially if your camp is still going to operate. Yeah. What does that look like? Looks like full refunds for a lot of people, um, if they're related to COVID-19 or whether or not they're related to COVID-19. Some people may be taking out software fees or potentially credit card fees to their 100% refunds. Mm -hmm. Trying to do credits instead of full refunds.
So I'm seeing a lot of them are saying like, if we cancel, so what if a parent is wanting to pull out um, even before uh, you cancel? I know here at UH, we have kind of a timeline and it decreases by percentage in which we give the refund. So if they're like canceling after a certain date, they only get maybe like 75% versus that full hundred. Is anybody uh, still going with that? If the parent pulls versus the cancellation hap happens? Oh, priority registration for next year and keeping a deposit. I think that's a really unique idea. That is. Something we looked at at UW-Madison was um, refunds based on the academic year. So there's still talk of maybe some K-12 start times moving up to July or August. So if that were to happen, we were going to give those refunds no matter what. A lot of people maybe not advertising full refunds, but would give it if pressed or um, if definitely pushed. Yes, Bill, we will talk about staff recruitment and training. That is definitely on our list. It's on the next slide. So it is. <laughs> so I guess we'll go ahead and move it forward <laughs> since it looks like a lot of people are screaming for um, staff. So let's talk about staff recruitment and hiring for those of us who are proceeding as normal. Um, I know here at um, UH and maybe I saw a few other institutions, you are on a hiring freeze, not only for professional staff, but also for student staffs. Um, so talking through how we're navigating with that recruitment as well as that potential um, training aspect to get them in. Um, let's hit it. How are, we, how are we functioning, you guys? <laughs> K-12. Okay, we can kind of talk about what's impacting us right now. I saw a lot of other people talking about it, but most universities, including the University of Houston, is on a hiring piece, not only for professional staff. We call it hiring pause uh, for not only professional staff, but we were now informed student employees up until the middle of this month and then and potentially farther. So we're still going to move forward with our, our uh, virtual interviews. We're going to have some Zoom uh, interviews happening here over the course of the next week. We're also hosting a virtual job fair for our entire department that we're going to continue to pull some of those people, those counselor positions from that, uh, specifically because our, our job pool has been a lot less. Uh, so uh, definitely wrote, we also contacted former counselors had that and come through that were like, hey, you said you weren't going to come back because you were going to go travel abroad and maybe had this potential great internship. And that's kind of gone off the rails. And so thinking about those returners who said maybe not this year, maybe their plans have changed and thinking about looking at contacting them as well. So there's some conversation about I-9s. The federal government has released uh, virtual I-9 information. So if your HR staff has not seen that, highly encouraged for those who those of you who are able to still hire, um, I-9s can now be done virtually. Um, a lot of people look like they're still conducting interviews but can't make offers yet. So trying to be um, inclusive to staff and really give them a date. That's something we've done at the University of Wisconsin. We've said, we will give you a date by April 24th, a yes or no. And that's what we feel comfortable with. Um, some people are doing virtual training, which is awesome. Um, I would kind of open it up. How much are you going to try to do virtual training versus have an in-person training as well? What topics are you going to, what topics need to be online um, versus what topics need to be in person? And then before we jump fully into that, I saw where there was one where someone said, hey, I'm hesitant to start hiring and offering because we might start a month later. Um, similar to what Abby just said, being very transparent and like communicating with them up front. I know for us, we have like contingency uh, contracts that we give them um, and we're changing our wording right now to accommodate if we do have to reduce camp or cancel camp um, and letting them know up front, hey, if this happens because of COVID-19, just know, like be prepared to have to have a plan B for a job. Um, not the best, but you know, we're all working through it. 
Yes, ACA does have some tremendous resources on online staff trainings as well as staff contracts. Um, there's a staff contract on their connect as well as a ton of online um, training. So if you are not an ACA member, you can be one for free for one year. Year. So this may be a great time to get your one year free membership to get all those resources. And no, I do not work for ACA, but um, there's the free code in the chat, ACA free, pretty easy. Uh, something that came up was American Red Cross and CPR. And if you haven't seen, there is a 90 day extension for a CPR pro or lifeguard certs. And they, it, American Red Cross has put out some social distancing guidelines related to classes. So in spaces that those classes can um, still occur. Those are still being allowed to at smaller kind of resources. Rochelle, yeah, go ahead. Awesome, so we had the aquatics round table yesterday and we had a whole bunch of American Red Cross reps on and they were able to go into really great detail about what we can and can't do for training and a lot of virtual training type stuff. And my rep also sent um, sent me all of the information that uh, she thought was applicable for people with those certifications. So there are provisional certifications that we can get now, like first aid and uh, CPR and CPR Pro. And I posted all of that um, on Nursa Connect today. So all of that information is available. And also um, I can funnel any information at people if they have questions after as well. Rochelle, I got a question for you. I know one of our, our aquatics professionals just today talked about um, American Red Cross doing a provisional for the lay responder, like right, our basic, the first aid and CPR for like 90 days. So even if you do blended learning now, you still have 90 days to do the in-person test out. Is that is that how it works or what they talked about? Do you know? Yeah, so, so uh, the provisional is you have to take a just like a short online course. And it basically just extends your current certification for 90 days. And that's for um, first aid, CPR for the lay responder and CPR pro. And it's also, um, the only trick with that is you need to go on and submit the course record for that. Um, so John, I'll make sure I can send you more info after. Thank you. What if they're not certified? That's only if they are already certified. It just extends them. So if I'm hiring someone who is not CPR certified and I need to train them, there isn't a provisional where they can do the skill set later. So if my facilities are closed and I can't go in to teach, then I have to just keep waiting. So you can do a blended learning CPR first aid class. Right. Um, and I would stack that as close to your opening as possible. And so that's like a really quick online course. And then they basically just have to come in and test out the skills. Yeah. So, yeah. So you guys with thinking about that, because I'm starting to see that uh, similar to uh, Red Cross, uh, some of you are saying that you want to do some blended learning. Um, so even with your training, you're saying part of it will be in person. So part of that, and this might be in your registration as well, but even with your student staff, are you doing any kind of pre-screening with them just to ask like, hey, have you potentially been exposed? Are you even like going as far as like taking temperatures for symptoms and things like that? Anybody um, thinking about exercising that as they start to um, get closer to the in-person interactions with the training and the hiring? Something that we considered here at UW-Madison with the um, help of our medical staff uh, with health services is yes to take temps daily and then to be able to have a contingency plan about what happens if a staff member has temps but then what also happens if a large group of your campers has temps. We have the ability to quarantine a small group of our campers but if it's everybody at one time what does that look like um, in terms of a contingency plan. So. Yes, what do those policies look like? Um, how are you informing parents? Are you changing your registration? Um, are people adding questions to their registration? That's something we were asked to do, asking about if people had traveled within the last 14 days. Is anyone else getting that directive from campus?
and a yes. So it would be whoever your um, responder would be within your camp um, or healthcare provider within your camp would be. Uh, they have permitted that you are allowed to now do that just because of COVID. Essentially, it was an uh, overly invasive process of taking a child's temperature or a staff member's temperature, but it, they are now allowing it. There's a question about a policy if a camper has a certain temp. Um, this should, may already be in your camp policies if you have a communicable disease policy, but um, we were told that our communicable disease policy wasn't enough for COVID-19. It only had a temperature of 100 degrees with additional symptoms. We were told by our health staff that if they have a temperature of 100 degrees period, they should not be at camp. So we had to change that policy, communicate with parents. So I'm curious for those of you, um, cause I'm still seeing that uh, we're still answering the question about virtual training. What platforms are you hoping to use as you go um, fully virtual? There was someone earlier that said they were 100% virtual. I'm trying to see if I can find that. Um, if you would share that resource for us uh, for how you're gonna be going fully virtual. I'm sorry. Um, could you repeat? You said what was the temperatures for the fevers? Ours was a hundred degrees. All right, Kent. I'm gonna go ahead and pull you in. If you could tell us a little bit more about. It looks like you're doing three or two different platforms. Kenton. Yeah. So uh, we already use. Uh, Canvas, we're switching over to Canvas right now for whenever we come back onto campus um, across UREC. So they'll be trained on that. They'll have some trainings on that. Um, that's a great tool for putting things online. Um, any, anything that is like a presentation based or we need to do discussions, we'll do over Zoom. So something that we can put them all on, get all on and discuss. Um, I saw earlier people were talking about camaraderie. Uh, we'll probably do some things over Zoom to help with that, just with um, getting them talking to each other and building some of those bonds before we can get in. Um, and then we also have, uh, um, we use safety skills for a lot of our like online trainings um, and they have some really good camp resources. Uh, so getting those assigned to them, they can do all of those virtually um, on their own times. I can set dates um, and deadlines and get emails and all of that. So it's really, it allows me to be as hands off as I need to be. Um, that's what we're doing right now for our students that are losing hours is we're giving them extra trainings on there. So camps will be rolled into that if, um, if we do get the go ahead. Nice, thank you. And then Jean Holt, you brought up <laughs> again an ACA plug, um, but could you talk to us just about some of those prepackaged programs that they are offering? So we used some of their um, pre-packaged stuff last year with some of our training. Um, they have a pre-packaged one, but actually we didn't do the pre-packaged. We put together some of our own stuff um, and it was just some of the general training. I don't remember what all we did, but it was some of the um, general topics um, that we felt bringing the ACA one in was gonna be better. And we also used a lot of our um, faculty on campus to do some stuff. We've also used, um, Tim, what is the one that Chris Thurber has? The, which, which one are you talking about? I'm sorry. EA, what is it? EA. The expert online training? Yeah, we've used that one before too. I think that was really expensive. So the ACA online training is a really reasonably priced. You can customize it. You can make it your own with branding. We, we work with a lot of universities on that as well. Um, and there's some really standard things as well as some really advanced things. So it's whatever you're looking to create. Um, and Tim, is that through like a third party or is that straight through um, ACA? Like do you resource it out? 
You know, it's, it's straight through us. So we have a library that has a ton of different packages um, and a lot of different resources. And so we can basically, we customize that. We have a staff um, that's really designated to help walk you through what you might be looking for. Um, and we can put a package together that works for you. Um, there's tons of different things you can choose from frontline staff to program director staff all the way up to executive level staff. Um, and I'll put the link for that here in the chat as well in just a second. Perfect, thanks, thank you. Do we have any questions coming up in the feed, Abby? <laughs> There's a lot going on, but I hear people about 100% virtual camp. Um, so let's get through a couple other questions then we'll transition to virtual camp and what that may look like. Um, I think I wanna go back to the creating camaraderie piece through virtual trainings. <laughs> What are some ideas that people are going to do if you are running 100% virtual training? How are you going to create camaraderie within your staff that then allows you to hit the ground running on day one? Vanessa Fielder, you've put a couple of really great comments from like Zoom breakout stuff, and then now you're talking about coffee hours and trivia nights. Would you be willing to unmute and talk about that? Sure. Um, one of the one of the things that we started with our staff right away because we were getting a lot of kind of those uncertainty, anxiety questions um, was just starting to connect with them via Zoom early on and we started doing Tuesday morning coffee hours and we do Thursday evening um, trivia nights and we have some of our leadership staff running those nights and as as we're hiring folks on we're inviting them into those groups already so that they can start kind of getting to know each other build that community that community that we're already feeling um, we have a couple other ideas where if you're familiar with the Jackbox program um, it's a game that's online and you can do that virtually as well um, but trying to find some different ways that we can start building that right now in case we do have to go more online for our training and have less in-person time. Um, or if there's, if it takes a longer time to get all our staff hired, if we don't end up running um, June camps and end up going into July instead. So we want to keep building that camp buy-in and that feeling too, because the more we can do now, the easier I think it's going to be um, when we all start feeling kind of that crunch time. And that's one of the big questions from that. Do you pay your staff for those coffee breaks and those trivia nights, or is that an optional thing they can participate in? We are paying the staff who are leading them. So we have some program assistants and some summer coordinators. So we're paying the ones that are putting that together, um, but it's optional for the rest of them to come in and do on their own. So it's not required. It's just totally something fun to do while everyone's stuck in their homes um, and get to know each other. So completely open, but anything that we're asking someone to do specifically or to um, facilitate, we are paying them. Nice, thank you. And then Jeff, you posted a link in here just about um, Michelle Cummings. Can you kind of tell us a little bit about that? Have you guys uh, used that at all? And just maybe a little bit more about that programming for the virtual team building? Yeah, so Michelle Cummings, uh, she's often at American Camp Association conferences. She has a company called Training Wheels and a lot of, uh, a lot of tools and resources for, uh, for team building. And then over the last couple of weeks, uh, she's been putting on these uh, Zoom sessions to, uh, to talk through uh, a bunch of different activities that, that camps can do or any, any groups can do uh, uh, for, for different ideas for virtual team building. Uh, she's also... She's got a handout there on the on the link. Uh, I think uh, one of the zooms was happening right now during uh, during this uh, during this time. But she did one last week, and I think she posted the video as well. Uh, and uh, then it's doing one um, next week on on April 9th. They're all free. Uh, over almost 500 people came to or have signed up uh, to one last week, and uh, just created a lot of really really great ideas for. Uh, for utilizing um, what you have virtually to, to bring your group together and build uh, build community. Nice, thank you. And then a question was, oh, go ahead, Abby. No, go ahead. Oh, I was gonna say, a question was posed just about even 
uh, for the camps, is anyone treating their camps differently, just depending on how you're structured? Are you like a recreational sport heavy camp, which uh, would lend you to more contact versus a non-contact camp that could be anything from like our STEM camps that are doing more things with their hands or computer technology programming? Um, are any of you operating differently in how you're moving forward or treating it differently in how you're moving forward? Or are your universities making you operate differently? Because I think those that decision might be very, might be made for you. I can speak to our campus. Our campus um, has said that only virtual youth programming can occur that have a direct pathway to admissions. So um, that kind of puts us in a bind, but um, that was our campus's decision. That wasn't a decision we had to make within REC. Uh, Nick, it looks like you guys have a variety of offerings that y'all do at Ohio State. Can you kind of talk about um, how you guys are differentiating and maybe where you're going to make up um, those specific things that you're taking out, like the sport in the kitchen camps? Sure, yeah. So here at Ohio State, we offer a lot of things. We have um, traditional camp, we do sports camps, we do kids in the kitchen camps, we do a traveling camp where we travel with our kids um, in our vans um, around different field trips. So we've been tasked to look at, um, if needed, based on making it as simple as possible um, and being a traditional camp and kind of getting rid of some of those specialty camps that kids are in close quarters, like kitchen. Um, they're really right on top of each other right there, touching a lot of things. Um, traveling in a closed van together with 20 teenage kids um, is being looked at. Um, so a lot of that is with our social distancing. Also, a lot of that is being driven now with um, hiring. Um, Ohio State did put a hiring freeze for everyone through June 30th. We start camp June 1st. Um, so that's gonna be interesting how we are going through that. Ohio State's actually leadership at the university is gonna be actually making summer camp decision this by the end of this week. So I'm just waiting for my email if we're even doing it. Um, so we've been tasked to look at, okay, what can we do as a traditional camp setting? Kind of to almost look to model what we can help our um, first responders at our med center um, kind of to create camp as like they're for those nurses, doctors who are going to need to be at work um, and kind of we're looking at that way now. Um, I know like in Ohio, um, we can become a pandemic child care center um, for this time. So we're kind of looking at those options to still even if the university tells us no um, to kind of look at can we do something to really help our med center people who typically are the ones that fill our camp in general. Um, so we are looking at contingencies on like how we can scale back um, and just still offer our traditional stuff, but kind of how to keep that social distance and limit as much as we can. Okay. We do. Michael, great question about if you thought about relocating the camp to like a school break or fall or Christmas break? Has anyone thought about that? Because I know that camp can be a big cash cow for some of our programs. Um, has anyone thought about how maybe they can um, alter it so that they're still able to engage with um, their community that they usually would in the summertime? It looks like for some people, uh, private coaches could potentially take their camps outside of university facilities if the facilities are not available. Moving, yeah, like you said, moving camps to non-summertime, but then Natalie brought up a good point. Um, if virus restrictions get lifted before the new normal school year starts, are people looking to launch camps early or outside, or like right when those virus restrictions get lifted? And I know that's something we were looking at, being ready to work around the K-12 schedule um, until we got different directive from campus. Crystal's making work, of her, work for herself and exploring winter break camps. Mike, can you tell us about your school's out day camps during the year?
Yeah, it's more or less uh, just a few day camps. Uh, a lot of times, like for spring break camp, um, we'll utilize our facility during that week. And a lot of times when they have like parent teacher conferences, we'll have uh, just some day camps um, as well. And then I guess similar to, I kind of want to move into this, uh, similar to our virtual trainings and offerings that we're going to be doing to build community. Is anyone exploring like that type of program also for their kids? I know for us um, at UH, like I said, we haven't, we're still fluid about where we're going to be. We're still operating as though we're going into camp normal. Um, and we were able to um, be a part of the Globe Goes to Camp with NASA pilot program. And one of the things that they have is a virtual option to do with camp uh, that we can potentially market to our parents so that they still get that um, aspect of camp and that interaction and that activity. Uh, are any camps thinking about maybe creating packages like that? That's like more of a stay at home and do activities with your kids so that you're building out that content for the parents. It looks as though Jeremy is a leader in this field. Jeremy, do you want to talk a little bit more about this Google Classroom that you've been using? I don't know about a leader. And sorry, I don't have my video. I haven't got a haircut, so my hair is out of control. Um, I don't know if I would say I'm a leader, but we've been looking at everything else like everybody else is doing. So um, I've got four of my students that are telecommuting now that campus is closed and they've taken the lead on starting a Google Classroom. Um, out here in California, um, a lot of our students are already familiar with that. Um, so we've reached out to some campers that we know and some on-campus parents and their kids have got in there and they've actually done some projects this week and completed it and kids have commented and said, hey, like one of them was a all about me collage and some kids were like, oh, I like basketball too. So like just trying to get that community together. Um, eventually what we're going to do is we're going to open it up to all currently enrolled campers. We have about uh, 350 plus campers that are already enrolled for this upcoming summer, fingers and toes crossed. So we're going to open it up to them and just offer it as a, a programming thing for them to do the next few months. And then worst case scenario, if camp doesn't happen, um, then we're going to do this for the summer. Um, haven't figured out the pricing yet. Um, so uh, that we don't know. Maybe I had put earlier in the chat, we're, out, we're thinking of if parents want to keep their deposit, um, then we can keep some revenue in this fiscal year and then that could give them priority registration for next summer. One idea is that maybe those folks that do that can also have access to the summer program. But again, we haven't flushed that out at all. Um, I see somebody in there about spying, that's totally fine. Especially if any of you have kids um, four to 13 and if they're bored right now, uh, send me a, we can connect offline and I can invite them so they can actually participate as a camper. Uh, I will go back on mute now. Thanks everybody, this is great. Jeremy, I have one more question, so don't come off mute yet. What were some of the risk management considerations that you all thought about with kind of virtual safety and virtual risk? Well, kind of, kind of what we're doing in the Google Classroom is because you have to be invited or you have to be given a link that has a password. Um, so we thought about that as parents. I have a 13-year-old as well, and I wouldn't want her in some random chat room that's not monitored. So that's why we're using the Google Classroom, um, so that way we can have it a uh, secure spot for the parents um, that know that it's being led by our staff. Um, I have my staff set up as teachers, so we're the only ones that can manipulate the program. Um, everybody else, all the other students, um, campers, and some parents um, haven't wanted their kid to have their kid Gmail, so they've given me their Gmail, so their students do the stuff through there, and I think some parents feel even more secure having to go through their Gmail. So if you're in as a student, you don't have any control, which is another security measure that they can't go in and start their own chat or start, it's not like Facebook or Instagram where they can try to connect and do that kind of stuff. They can only be in there as a student and participate as a student. So that's one of the security measures. If we do do this in the summer, um, we would probably do like, a, like some of our reservations departments do a hello sign and probably do like a virtual, have the parents just like we would for a normal summer, have them sign the waiver. Um, so we'd have them do that for those that participate in the summer just to have that waiver signed uh, for the summer. But for right now, we're just putting it out there as a community service project just to keep everybody uh, connected. But great question. Awesome. Thank you for sharing. I know something that we have been tasked to do is to just provide resources to our campers and be that um, Good Samaritan, provide the goodwill from campus. Um, so that's been something 
that we have been doing um, that's not a virtual program we're running, but just being the curator of information for our families. Nick, we're not currently actively running a program, just providing links to services and what other people are doing. Yes, Microsoft Teams is wonderful. Thanks, John Janice. Anything else about virtual programming? All right. So obviously this is only round one of a two-parter, right? Um, so we're gonna open the floor up. Are there any additional questions you guys would like us to address that maybe we got about 15 minutes, we can potentially talk through in the group now, um, otherwise that you would want us to go more in depth on in the next session. As folks are uh, thinking about additional topics, something that came up a couple of times was being a child care center. And I know Nick mentioned it a little bit. Um, our, our university has looked into it, but is anyone currently a child care center for essential services or looking to become that this summer? Hi, everyone. So I'll just speak shortly on that. Um, not currently at a university. I apologize. Please don't hold it against me. I'm the director of an after school program uh, in San Francisco right now, where we are majorly shut down, and there are a lot of essential workers that um, work at the private school that I am currently the director of after school programming at. So I'm seeing about three to six. Um, students a day and um, and that's just great for me in a sense of uh, being able to keep some people staffed and also really been great for me to um, keep up with CDC guidelines on masks and taking temperatures and I can share those things if it's um, important but of course it was updated today uh, personally in San Francisco we had a new public health order released for uh, all the Bay Area counties um, so it's been interesting. Um, one of the things to keep in mind if you are meeting with groups right now, one of the CDC guidelines is that there can be uh, only groups of 10 or 12 actually, but I planned on limiting that to 10. And then once a group of students is together, they couldn't um, move from one group to the next, um, of course, because that's kind of together. So just uh, interesting challenges that I might uh, be facing in the, in the upcoming weeks. So Dominique, I saw your, oh, nice, thank you. <laughs> Abby, gotcha. I was about to say, we have Tim on the call. Tim, do you wanna speak more towards kind of the ACA accreditation process? We have a few people that are actually interested um, if you kind of wanna talk to that. Yeah, absolutely. So it, there's a couple different things. So we do have a number of universities that are going through that. So my background real quick is I do work for ACA full time and I am what we call the camps on campus coordinator. So I work with higher ed institutions and K through 12 institutions that are running camps on campus. Um, and so thank you, Nick, for the shout out for that join camps on campus. Um, again, if you have that free membership with ACA, you can join um, my email address is um, thucton at acacamps.org as well, and I'll post that. So if you have questions or want to get in touch with me, um, but we've got the ability to work with any of your universities to get you through accreditation if that's something you're interested in. Um, there's a little bit more of a timeline than we probably want to go into today, um, but again, I'm happy to reach out to anybody or follow up calls, um, but we have a wonderful, wonderful opportunity for that to happen. The other thing that somebody mentioned was we do have a great page on our ACA website for COVID-19 that is for free. All the resources are on the outside of the paywall. And so it's a great opportunity to connect and see what we've got going on. And we have webinars for each state field office as well. So the local health department will be in that. And all of that is on the ACA website. I 
I would open it up as we think about topics. Do we want our next round table to focus on COVID-19 or would folks rather it look at camps in general? And I know uh, for some, COVID-19 is all encompassing, but for some we may be planning for 2021 at this point. Um, so what are some thoughts about COVID-19 related second round table or camp in general second round table? Ah, I like Rochelle, general with a little bit of COVID-19, okay. Yeah, this is Katie's screen. I would stop looking at this point, it's scary. So it's looking like maybe a little bit more general about summer camp, but taking updated COVID-19 because a week from now, we know we're all gonna be in a very different spot. Um, so we'll continue to have some more general topics, but definitely some time for COVID-19 as well. For those of you who are saying COVID-19, what in particular are we looking for? Just updates about what people are doing um, or what are we looking for COVID-19? Things that we didn't, didn't talk about, best practices. I hear you, Bill. Okay. Thank you, Ashley. That's a super helpful um, updates and resources. Cool. We will uh, continue to bring in all of our resources. Recruiting, yeah, recruiting staff a lot can change between now and then. Here, I'll load in three files that we got today. Sorry if you see it on my screen uh, from the um, Texoma. Uh, oh, never mind. Tim just did it. Thanks, Tim, uh, <laughs> for you guys to reference for additional resources as well. So for those of you who did say you were canceling and who are gonna join us next time, um, be prepared to share your why. I can share ours. Uh, we were told to from upper leadership, from campus, not within REC. So um, that decision was made for us, but as the rest of you are, are canceling, um, think about that why. Jeremy, marketing and brand preservation, that's definitely a good one to add for next session. Katie, you want to talk about the resources you have up? Yeah, so we kind of mentioned them throughout the time, but uh, just so you guys know, please, please take advantage of the resources. We are all one big community and we're all trying to fight through this um, as a team. Um, so for NERSA, obviously we have our round table. So part two is going to be next week. Uh, same time on Thursday, so join us 2 p.m. Uh, and then we also have the Nurse to Connect. If you haven't logged onto that in the discussion board, please check that out. I think Abby might have tab, um, tagged it earlier in the chat. Uh, we will save this chat so you'll have access to this as well as this recorded video later. Um, in addition, ACA, um, American Camp Association, has a plethora of resources for you guys as far as like guidelines, wordage, how to communicate with parents, um, campers, any kind of health um, and risk management things we might be running into as this is going to change some of our EAPs anyways. Um, so they are also offering webinars um, in addition to the roundtable talk that we're offering. Um, they have discussion board posts and they also have a resource center which Tim actually posted here in the chat. Um, so if you're like, hey, I want to dive deeper and dig a little bit deeper um, into my resources, here are some avenues for you. So please check those out. Oh. Awesome. So we are going to keep the chat rolling for the next five or so minutes if you have topics that you want so that we can um, continue to host next roundtable. And then now that we have everybody who does camps on their campus, we can create a, our little subgroup with the NURSA to make sure that we're all staying connected. For sure. So with that, how's everybody doing? Now's our self-care moment. <laughs> you guys holding up okay? <laughs> oh, Vanessa, I'm there with you. So many carbs. All I do is eat and talk to my roommate. <laughs>
Gene, you asked about the Institute. It has not been canceled yet from what I'm aware of, but there is a planned summer camps um, pre-conference already. Uh, again, that's in July in uh, Vermont, if you're looking at that. Um, uh, I know I don't know who's leading it, but uh, I did see it on, on there that it, it, it was a part of the pre-conference pack. So, I, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, so I can tell you who's leading it. I'm leading it. Woo! Good. I'm glad someone was found. So, yeah, it's um, um, Sarah Wright and I are doing it. Wonderful. Gene, I also kind of am enjoying working from home. I'm very hit or miss, though. Yeah. Well, I've been doing little projects at home. So I get up in the morning and you know, I'll do a, a little project and then um, I'll do work stuff. And I think the worst part is my husband works in public schools. And so he, you know, they're not doing anything and he just doesn't quite get that I'm still working. And it's like, you know, I'm still working. <laughs> so. Yeah, I'm with uh, Crystal on here. I did not prepare for a comfortable chair, you guys. I'm struggling. I'm in a bar stool. <laughs> Thank you all for joining us. It looks like our number is dwindling, especially those East Coasters who it's past <laughs> your work time. Whatever yeah. work time means these days, we appreciate you. Uh, yeah, thank you guys so much for joining for the feedback. We'll definitely be taking all of this and we hope to see you return for uh, session number two on the 9th at 2 p.m. Look for some more spirited conversations. I think a lot of us will kind of know exactly or a little bit more on uh, where we are with the go or no go. So I thank you guys once again so much for joining us. This is great. Bye.